the quick, the very, very quick summary is that there's three main ideas, play, pattern, and social species. So play allows us to practice skills and downtime that we need later. We're a very social species, so we need a lot of information about social life. But being social also makes us realize that we uh, may not know enough about the, um, the world around us, and so it makes us curious. And pattern information is, is something that we use to understand the world. And so this leads us to an increased interest in playing with the patterns of social life. And this explains our deep interest in fiction and stories. And that's the very high level uh, summary of, of the thesis. Here's the thing, like, it's a bit of a special occasion because this is our 50th episode. Oh, I did not really. Is it really? Oh, wow. No way. Yeah. Yeah. It's our 50th episode that we'll be releasing. That's cool. Good for us. So I was just curious, like, what your thoughts on the entire podcast trajectory has been so far. Like, let's do some reflecting, bro. Oh, uh, wow. You've really caught me off guard. Yeah. <laughs> I feel we, don't like, have, yeah. we don't have to. Don't have I feel to like I have zero too. profound thoughts. I haven't done much, uh, much thinking about it either, but I'm just curious, like... Uh, I remember our first episode, it was, um, I was recording our shitty little studio apartment in the middle of, or the very beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we had to toss the first episode because I don't even remember what we were talking about, but it was just like unlistenable. Dualism, but, uh, baby. It was a dualism. In the first, it was dualism. Because how the podcast started is we got into a drunken debate over Christmas with our families. Yeah about That's dualism right. and That's then right. you yeah. contacted me and was like maybe we should just start recording <laughs> these <laughs> these conversations in which <laughs> totally we yell at right. each other and put them on the internet i think it was shortly after i had recorded the podcast about dualism with chesto because that would so have been like 2019 uh, so i was all fired up about dualism and then you and i started going at it yeah in like over christmas with our whole family sitting by wondering what the hell are these two kids talking about um and then we kind of started from from there and it took a bit of time to get our feet but i, th I think the yeah. first episode was particularly uninteresting because i mean one the audio quality was terrible but two yeah. in between our debate and recording the episode i had basically completely changed my mind <laughs> <laughs> and so we we kind of set up this episode thinking we were going to have like this feisty debate and it was going to be awesome right. we we're going to be yelling at each other and then by the time i actually got there i just i like, couldn't in good conscience <laughs> fake my position anymore i was like okay i think he's actually right so we like showed up and like, the first and then you put your position on the table first thing i said was like okay i think i agree so uh <laughs> well and then you did that to me as well in the social media one too right like we had a fiery debate the first episode and then the second episode i was like okay i'm ready like let me back in coach and you're like I agree. It's like, okay, well, fuck. Yeah. I, was, I had all this Which, energy ready to go. Um, but, in retrospect, uh, I think yeah. I should have been more, a little more hard line on. Like, I think now I've retreated somewhat from that position again. I'm like somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Not a bit. Yeah. I mean, some weird superposition of like, it's not as bad as everyone thinks it is, but it's also not great either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think like I'd have to go back and re-listen to that episode, but I think that's probably the line that we were taking. Similar to like the AGI stuff. It's not to say there's no problems, but let's just be a little careful not to magnify the problem beyond its scope. So I think like we are more pushing back against like the documentary, uh, The Social Dilemma, talking about how social media is like creating a totalitarian privacy state while recognizing that there's like effects of social media has negative effects on say like uh, teenage uh, depression rates and uh, and recognizing those which aspects. even that stuff is unclear well because height posted something and then there's like a counter argument <laughs> yeah. to height and so every time there's like seems to be some progress like somebody else go, d goes and does like a detailed like literature review and says the claims aren't nearly as supported as as they initially yeah. seem so then what assertions about the negative effects of social media do you find more plausible well so i think that your most convincing point in the episode was that it's unclear to what extent it's creating social discontent and um, unraveling social cohesion, and to what extent we're just seeing that at the surface now. So people always were able to be, for example, like radicalized and hold extreme positions by just going to the library, embedding themselves in certain books, but they had, didn't have the ability to tweet about it. And so fewer people would come to recognize that they were in they would fewer people saw other opinions uh, because they were just like enmeshed in their community. And so whatever norms predominated in community was presumably like kind of what they thought. Mm -hmm. um, and so any sort of polarization that did exist wasn't there at the surface mm -hmm. as much. Mm -hmm. So it was just less easy to spot. Right. And so that very problem makes it difficult to understand what levels of polarization there were in the past. Yeah. But where, where I stand now is like, 
the fact that polarization can be on the surface in and of itself is like a significant change. Can feed back into the polarization itself. itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so those kind of effects, I think just common, starting from like a common sense sort of point of view of like, okay, what would happen now if you can see like all these deranged opinions um, whenever you want and mm-hmm, look, mm-hmm. like whenever you log onto Twitter and they're just available for you to see what sort of like effects is that going to have on our dialogue and stuff? And I don't know, but I think it's too strong a claim to say that they're all good or at least mm-hmm. not even that they're all good, but to say like, they're all mundane and not that serious. Mm -hmm. So it's more just a position of like, I'm pretty highly uncertain about what effects that's having. I don't think anyone knows super well, but it's probably good to be like wary of those kind of effects. Mm -hmm. And it would be surprising if creating those sort of feedback loops didn't have any sort of effect, especially on our like dialogue and discourse Mm -hmm. and um, certain arguments about like news, uh, like uh, writers, for example, having as Twitter, their main sphere of communication mm-hmm. and having to respond to things that happen on Twitter and the things that happen on Twitter being driven by the extremes. That seems like a pretty robust argument to me. And I can see like those effects actually having an effect on like, for example, what sort of articles are written in mainstream news sources like New York Times, et cetera, right? If those writers are accountable to the sorts of dynamics that play out on Twitter, that does seem like a significant sort of shift in the traditional media landscape. So one example of that, that I heard recently that um, I thought was just so fascinating came from the recent podcast series about JK Rowling. Did you hear this? Mm, I did listen to it. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's utterly, it's completely fantastic. All of our listeners should listen to it. If they haven't already, it's um, produced by Megan Phelps Roper, the daughter of um, Fred Phelps of the uh, Westboro Baptist church. And so she is very interested in uh, the effect of belief and, and how that can inform uh, action. So Megan Phelps Roper goes and interviews J.K. Rowling um, and uh, talks about the trans issue on both sides of the debate. Um, but in, I think, the third episode, she talks about the effect of Tumblr and 4chan on um, our discourse. And this plays into what you were saying about how having journalists get uh, use Twitter as their primary um, information source uh, can have negative effects because it can kind of amplify the polarization, which is like already mm-hmm. taking place. Um, but what she talks about with the uh, 4chan and uh, Tumblr is she says that I think it was, and, and you listened to this episode too, so please correct any of the details that I get wrong, but I think it was like circa 2012, 2013, you had these two online communities being formed and they were similar and mirror opposites to one another in interesting ways. So they're similar in the sense that both 4chan and Tumblr were uh, very uh, unmoderated and you could make anonymous accounts. Um, They're different in the sense that Tumblr skewed female um, and went in the direction of like radical compassion and 4chan skewed male and went in the direction of like radical offense. So out of uh, 4chan, you started having like QAnon and Pepe the Frog and like the very concept of like an internet meme came from 4chan. Out of Tumblr, you started getting the 72 genders. You started getting concepts like white privilege and trigger warnings and demisexual and animal kin and all these different different, different kind of, kinds of concepts. Um, and the two communities knew about each other and fucking hated each other and started like making memes about each other and, and uh, kind of amplifying and reinforcing uh, the two, um, and, and radicalizing the two sides. Uh, but then what she says, uh, Megan Phelps Roper, what she says uh, is that 4chan kind of stayed in the background of society and didn't really hit mainstream. Whereas Tumblr discourse just met Twitter discourse and met New York times journalists, Mm -hmm. um, and met journalists from Vox and journalists from MSNBC, uh, And all of a sudden, these high-profile journalists started adopting the language of the Tumblr community. And so what started from like 14-year-old, 16-year-old angsty teenagers in their basement uh, writing blogs about um, 72 genders became like uh, the default norm in the New York Times. And that's when we started seeing the peak of, or like the rise of what we now call uh, wokeness in um, in like 2017, 2018. Um, and I, I don't think that's like the full story. I think that the way that uh, Roper described it, she kind of ignored the um, influence of academia and how a lot of these ideas also got started in, in academia. And there's like a long history of like 
uh, postmodernism and, and stuff which feeds into it. But I do think that it's a really interesting uh, component to the wokeness story. And I also think that it is direct evidence of what you're saying of how um, having journalists uh, kind of get their news from the online news can increase radicalization. And uh, I just thought it was a, a nice example uh, to kind of illustrate the point that you were yeah. making. Yeah, one fascinating aspect of that story that I expect someone could write a like great essay about this is that I think one page on Tumblr um, started by some young kid was like, uh, what was it called? It was like, like why your favorite celebrity is problematic or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, this yeah. page yeah. like existed to just point out like problems, meaning basically just like opinions that weren't left enough, yeah. presumably, yeah. Um, yeah. of like certain celebrities, right? So people could pile on. And so, I mean, 4chan also had these dynamics where they could like pick out a public person and then like start making fun of them, et cetera, mm-hmm. and pile on. But s- something about Tumblr, but celebrities started thinking that they actually had to like, for example, respond, if people were like yeah. piling on them on that page, they had to respond, right? They had, right. And so that gate, that sort of lended this page legitimacy. Yeah. And then it blew up into this big thing where like, now you can accuse anyone of anything, et cetera. And that like fed, you know, people would write real articles about all this. And so there's an interesting asymmetry of like, why that happened on Tumblr? Like, why did that page, why yeah. did people, real celebrities feel the need to actually respond to yeah. that sort of stuff on Tumblr and they didn't on something like 4chan? I, I expect yeah. there's like, uh, you know, some nice essay to be written about that. Well, but, I, I think know. it's, I think part of it probably comes from the fact that Hollywood skews left already. So when you get a critique from people further to the left than you, I think you feel more of an obligation to respond because you're being critiqued from your kind of your own side. Whereas if you got a critique from people on the far right, like uh, 4chan, like 4chan, maybe it, <laughs> yeah, like, it, who gives a shit? it might not be accurate to say 4chan is like Republican or right leaning, but I think that would at least be the perception from people on the, the left. And so when you get a critique from them, it's like, oh, you can just blow that off because that's just from the other guys. Uh, so a bunch of Nazis over be, there. Yeah, it's yeah. just a bunch of Nazis over there. Um, but, uh, when I was listening to Megan Phelps Roper talk about that, I was kind of thinking about our social media episodes, um, yeah. and how there's definitely like, it's just hard to say, it, it, it's kind of like trying to predict what the effect of polarization is on a society from the internet itself. It's like, well, yeah, it's definitely going to create polarization, but it also creates a bunch of other things at the same time too. Um, and so it's really hard to do a full accounting of like, what, what is the effect of polarization from the invention of books? Well, definitely there's polarization. Yeah, 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 but, yeah exactly. Uh, but it's, it's hard to say what, uh, like, do a full a full uh, accounting. And so my sense also is that perhaps, like, the tools haven't been developed to think about the differences between just dissenting opinion and polarization. Like, there seems to be this tendency for us to label any sort of disagreement we see in public as polarization when mm-hmm. clearly you want people disagreeing in public, right? Like mm-hmm. what, what, what sort of, it would be a totalitarian state if you didn't have anyone disagreeing in public. So, but at what point does it become polarization? Right? Because I, I do yeah. agree like polarization in the extreme in which people are just taking, like, you know, I have some political tribe, they just adopt whatever those positions are without really critically thinking through it. And they just throw that in the face of the other tribe that I agree. That's bad. But people just like disagreeing about policies and things and even like calling each other bad names. That's sort of always going to be part of like some health. There's like a healthy amount of debate to have in society about those things. And so trying to figure out where that dividing line is between just like a healthy amount of disagreement and polarization is is quite tricky. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, I don't know what the right level what the right level of polarization is, but obviously some amount of polarization is required. And like, I know that Hitchens would always say that he wants more polarization. Uh, because when you have two poles, you can see kind of the the problem very clearly from both sides and uh, through the dialectic or or whatever. But uh, but obviously, if you have too much of it, then it can just tear a society apart. And so I don't really know what the right answer is. My answer uh, in one of the episodes was, I think we just need different spaces that allow for different kinds of conversations. So Twitter's kind of like the battleground. I'm always more nervous to submit something onto Twitter than to like the peer review system. Because Twitter is like where the actual peer review takes place, whereas the <laughs> the peer review is just three random people who I'm never going to meet commenting anonymously. But when you attach your name to something and you put it out there, then that's the, like the real battleground. But you don't want every space to be like that. Like I wouldn't want hmm. Instagram to be like that, and I wouldn't want uh, uh, Facebook to be like that. And so I think just having different uh, arenas that you can step into and step out of is the way or is the only solution I can see to the question of how much polarization is is good. Uh, just some areas are going to be like the 
octagon and other areas are going to be like a playground and we just want everything in between um so you can pick and choose uh but yeah so yeah i don't know back to your original question though like yeah very happy we started the podcast it's been an interesting i feel like my perspective has mostly been that i would do it anyway regardless of like Hmm. if anyone was listening or not because it's so helpful to have to think through your ideas in public and have them criticized right away. Mm-hmm. Like, and even just preparing for episodes, like I learn way more knowing that we're going to have to like talk about it. I'm going to have to defend certain positions <laughs> yeah, to you yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're going to push back on them than if I was just like reading it passively. And yeah. so I don't know if honestly, like if anyone's thinking of starting a podcast, I would just say fucking do it. Especially if you're, you have like, maybe it's different if you're interviewing people, et cetera, and you're trying to like become a big name, but when it's just like you yeah. and me shooting the shit, and I know I have to defend a position to you. Like it's helped me think through so many issues that I know I just wouldn't have thought through as rigorously. Yeah. So it's yeah, been likewise, like, likewise. it's been a fucking awesome in, in that sense. Yeah, it's like, been a, it's yeah, been a yeah. wild ride, brother. And uh, <laughs> we have like 60% left of conjectures and refutations to do and they'll know, just choose, <laughs> choose another book and uh, <laughs> keep going through it. But I also like the open endedness. Like I don't, like we never really think more than a couple episodes ahead. So I don't know what we're going to be talking about in a couple episodes for now. But I, I just like the fact that it's kind of this uh, unbounded exploration of whatever is interesting at the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of like the open exploration, I'm curious, maybe we should get drinks first. But I'm curious yeah. to hear you describe. Yeah, okay, let's get drinks. Should we, we'll should we get into it? And then we'll, yeah, yeah let's, let's get, get drinks and boom. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about an evolutionary account of the origins of art put forward by Brian Boyd, who's a researcher at the University of Auckland? Auckland, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Auckland? Yeah. So I, so I have to confess that when Vaden first, when you first proposed this subject, I did not take it that seriously. And I kind of thought like, okay, an evolutionary account of art, like who doesn't have one of those at their back pocket? You know, you just whip those out during your cocktail party and you throw it at the, the nearest girl to, to impress her, et cetera. So I figured like, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll read this essay that he's, uh, that he's put forward and then we'll debate about it a bit. So I read the essay and I was very intrigued. And so I started reading the book from which the essay is sort of derived and realized that this is no ordinary evolutionary account of art. I've realized like it's quite detailed. <laughs> it's like quite a sophisticated theory. Um, and so I can't recommend the book highly enough. It's very interesting. There's nothing, there's like no greater joy in life for me than coming across some subject of study that I didn't even know was a subject of study. I, I didn't know you could study this as rigorously as, as Boyd has. And so reading about it has like been totally amazing because as far as I'm concerned, no one had given like a proper evolutionary account before him. And so I think he's like sort of the main scholar in the field. Um, but I'm curious, like, so this Brian Boyd fella, you you came across him and you sent me this essay and said we should talk about it. How did you find this guy? Because he's sort of sitting right at the intersection of all your interests. And it seems yeah. like evidence that God exists. If, uh, <laughs> so like, yeah. what's going so Brian, on here? Brian Boyd is criminally underappreciated. I think in terms of the quality of his scholarship, he's easily at the level of Pinker or Dawkins. But the first half of his life... And what he's most known for is his work on Nabokov, so Vladimir Nabokov. Um, and he is seen as the preeminent Nabokov scholar. Uh, no one knows Nabokov better than uh, Brian Boyd, so just a bit of context. So Boyd did his PhD thesis in, at University of Toronto studying um, Ada, which is uh, Popper's most difficult book. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Nabokov's most difficult book. Some people uh, wait. Is it? Pre- it's pronounced. I've been, have I been pronouncing Nabokov wrong? My okay. Life? So that's another thing. So <laughs> Nabokov has an essay talking about how people mispronounce his name, or just like a couple paragraphs. And so I, I don't actually know how to properly pronounce it. Uh, sometimes I say uh, Nabokov, uh, but I've listened to Boyd say uh, Nabokov. Oh, um, so and he's I, the and then, eminent scholar. So <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to change my pronunciation. Okay. But, let's get to know. Um, but his name is so often mispronounced that. Nabokov himself has written about all of the various ways you can mispronounce it. And then the Mm. proper pronunciation, you have to use like a Russian accent. Uh, And so I'm not (laughs) going to attempt to, uh, to do that. But, um, but yeah, so uh, I'll probably switch back between the two pronunciations, but uh, please, Boyd, if you're listening to this, forgive me. Um, But uh, so yeah, so Boyd did his uh, PhD thesis on Ada, which is easily seen as Nabokov's uh, most difficult book, but um, reading Boyd's PhD thesis so impressed Nabokov's widow, Vera, that she allowed Brian Boyd access to Nabokov's archives. Um, And this is a hugely important and significant thing, both because 
Boyd then set to categorize and uh, publish a lot of the unpublished writings of Nabokov. So now he, we have access to uh, the private letters he wrote between him and um, Wilson, uh, Edmund Wilson. Uh, we have access to uh, his lectures on literature. There's a whole new book with miscellaneous writings um, called Speak, Write, Think. Um, and all of this has come from uh, Boyd's um, access to the uh, Nabokov's um, hmm. uh, archives. Um, but this also speaks to the quality of uh, his scholarship, because Vera would not just let anybody uh, look mm -hmm. at all of the unpublished uh, writings uh, of her late husband, um, unless uh, he was unbelievably careful and diligent to accurately represent uh, the work. And if you people either know um, Nabokov or they don't, and you can't really talk about him in the same way as Popper, you just have mm -hmm. to dive in and start seeing just how how this man thought. Um, and hmm. I won't even attempt to explain, explain him, but just for anyone who hasn't explored, just dive in anywhere and start, start exploring, um, because you'll, you'll never stop. Um, but so, okay. So the story continues, um, upon getting access to the archives, Boyd then set to write definitive biography on uh, Nabokov broken into two parts. The first part is called the Russian years. And the second part is called the American years. And that took him, I don't know when he, when he started, but I think he published it in 1996. And this was given the blessing of Vera Nabokov. And she was kind of burned, or her and her husband were burned by a previous biographer who, um, who did a, a shoddy job in the 60s. So she was very, um, oh. uh, I forgot the other biographer's name, but um, Nabokov was very unhappy with the quality of the work and sent like mm. 200 page, pages of revisions um, and was just very displeased by the quality of the biography. And so Vera was not going to let that happen again. Um, mm. And so the fact that she trusted Boyd to do a biography of her husband just, again, indicates the quality of his scholarship. Um, so that was in 1996. So he finished those in 1996. And then who did he decide to start a biography on next? Uh, Sir Karl Popper. Um, and so since 1996, Boyd has been writing a biography of Popper, which has remained unpublished. Uh, so he's been working on this for almost 30 years. Um, and when it comes out, Boyd will easily be the preeminent Popper scholar, too, because this is how serious he takes his scholarship. Um, and so when you read his website... Uh, he says that his work on Popper has taken him to like 20 countries around the world. Um, and it's going to tell the story Jesus. of Popper in a way that's like, hasn't been told, told before. So the man knows what he's talking about. And so he's writing his Popper biography. Um, and then about four or five years into that project, or uh, I might be getting the timeline a little incorrect. Um, he starts working on the book that we're going to be discussing today, which is on the origin of stories. And you can see quite immediately why he would be interested in an evolutionary account of storytelling because of his interest in uh, Nabokov, who is primarily a fiction, fiction writer, although he's done a bunch of scientific work on uh, butterflies uh, as well. And Popper, who talks about how science starts from myth and science starts from storytelling. And so the reason I'm so interested in Boyd's work is I think that he, through writing this book, has plugged a major hole in Popper and Deutsch's account of knowledge production. And mm -hmm. so like from Popper, we learn that science starts from myth and through criticism, through evidence, through scientific ex experiment, the myth slowly evolves and becomes what we call uh, scientific theories and, uh, and knowledge. And then Deutsch kind of builds on both ends of this. So Deutsch says, okay, well, uh, you don't stop there. The, the goal is to get what he would call or hard to vary explanations. And in his most recent uh, interview with, I forgot the name of the podcast, on, oh, on our Ferriss, recent Tim Ferriss. Tim yeah. Ferriss, yeah. His most recent interview with Tim Ferriss, Deutsch is saying that he is now thinking of explanations as a kind of story. Um, so explanations and storytelling are, are deeply um, intertwined. Um, and then Deutsch also built on Popper's theory on the other end too. So he doesn't just um, add to it by talking about how science aims at explanations, but he starts earlier than the myth. And he says that knowledge actually begins from evolution, from DNA. Um, and you have DNA and then you have uh, like a jump to universality in the human being. And we can now start uh, developing stories and theories about, about the world. So um, knowledge begins in evolution, DNA, jump to human beings, human beings, uh, myth, theories, explanations. But in that jump is a big missing gap because we need to explain why humans like to tell stories in the mm. first place. Um, mm. 
because it's actually incredibly counterintuitive and non-obvious. So the vast majority of stories that people tell are stories which both the speaker and the listener know are fictional, know aren't true. So the speaker is intentionally saying something that isn't true. And the receiver is receiving something which they know isn't true. And they know the speaker knows it's not true. And they know the speaker knows that the listener knows it's not true. So everybody knows it's not true. Yet they do it um, anyways. And if you have like two tribes, I think the prediction would be that a tribe which only communicated true information would have an evolutionary advantage over a tribe that wasted a lot of time conveying false, fake information. So if you have a tribe which only communicates things like the jaguars in the bushes or um, here's a source of food, true factual information, that tribe would have an advantage over ones that, uh, that engage in this make-believe, this fictional storytelling. Mm-hmm. And so you would expect that evolution would have bred into us a resistance to fiction and a resistance to uh, the telling of stories um, and myths. But thank God that it hasn't. And thank God that evolution has actually created a species which likes to engage in storytelling, myth, uh, religion, and eventually explanation, because that's the the origin of, of, um, of science. And so I think what Boyd's done is he's filled in this giant missing piece of, of evolutionary epistemology, um, by giving an evolutionary account to why we like to tell stories. Um, and in that sense, he's kind of deepened Popper's theory. And this makes a lot of sense because he knows Popper very well. Um, and he's uh, bridged the gap between where Deutsch leaves off and where Popper Popper begins. And so that's why I think uh, what Boyd's done is is um, hugely significant and enriches our understanding of evolutionary epistemology because Popper didn't want to go into the psychology because he just thought it was too subjective and too close mm-hmm. to belief. And so we kind of stopped at the level of psychology. But Boyd's probed one layer deeper. Um, and that's what, why I think that listeners to this podcast and, and people who've kind of been following us on our journey of Popper and Deutsch would stand to gain quite a lot from an understanding of, of, of Boyd's theories. Uh, yeah. So let's start from the beginning, like you mentioned, and ask, like, why are humans so, why do we appreciate art and story so much? And you actually, so you said one thing there that I find to be a constant tension in his work, which is that he does lean in a sort of group selectionist way in some of his evolutionary accounts. So he will mm-hmm. talk about like advantage of tribes against other tribes, etc. Um, you know, we're in the middle of reading or nearly at the end of reading the selfish gene. And this sort of discussion is anathema to, to, to Dawkins, mm-hmm. right? So he's, he comes out swinging very strongly against the group selectionists. Um, and Boyd, he talks about individual selection as well, but there is this sort of group selectionist, like groups that engage um, in art, et cetera, for various reasons will outcompete groups that don't, which always makes me slightly uncomfortable when he does it. And I think from from I think you can actually just basically remove those aspects from his thesis and it stays intact. I think you can just look at it from an individual and gene selectionist viewpoint where you just ask like, OK, why are individuals so invested in art? So good evolutionary accounts are predictive in the sense that they would say, if you're doing something that costs a lot of time and energy, right? And so you're doing it at the expense of other things, then an an evolutionary theory would say that you're going to be outcompeted by something that's not, if if the products of that sort of labor is useless, you're going to be outcompeted by something that's not spending their time doing that. And so the fact that individuals... Um, will spend so much time refining details of various artistic works and are so interested in, like, yeah, myth in terms of fiction and stories, but also just art more generally. Like, what the fuck's going on there? So I think you can can pose the riddle that he's trying to answer without going to the tribe against tribe group selectionist type of thing. Uh, Yeah, well, just to comment on that. So um, I don't think his thesis requires group selectionist arguments. Um, And I think reading uh, Dawkins, there are... A number of places, and I, I can't think of an example at the moment, where you can tell both a group selectionist story and a, like a genes eye view story as well. Mm-hmm. And my impression is as long as you have the genes eye view, so it's always what's the good of the gene first, but then mm-hmm. if a selfish gene can propagate its way through a species, and then that just so happens to create, in addition, a group advantage, then there's nothing about um, the selfish gene model which says you can't additionally have group advantages as well. It's only when you say that replication and selection happens at the level of groups do you start running into problems. Yeah, um, you but, just can't but, reason at the level of groups competing yeah, against one but, another. But, but right, if you have a, a selfish gene which 
in addition creates say group cohesion then then i think that's permissible um, yeah, from the perspective yeah. of, of evolution but but yeah exactly but you have to explain it from that yeah. genes level right you can't yeah. say like oh it benefits this tribe if you stop the analysis at benefiting tribes yeah then you have you haven't done enough work right and so there are yeah. some points so he he does talk about it in the mode of individual selection quite a bit but like one sort of uncomfortable feeling i get when i'm reading his book i feel like he's more sympathetic to group yeah, selection perhaps. than perhaps I would like after reading after reading Dawkins. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll say a few words to try to set the stage for the theory that we're going to uh, discuss. A couple words to, to set the stage. So the book is titled On the Origin of Stories. So he's primarily interested in uh, giving an evolutionary account of humans' proclivity to tell stories. But stories are one of the four major forms of artistic expression. So the four being song, dance, design, and stories. And I was thinking about that. Does that category of four make sense? And I think it actually does, uh, because those are like the four fundamental forms of artistic expression, where design includes a lot like fashion and architecture and obviously visual arts. Um, and then when you get things like cinema and opera and television, they are just combinations of these four forms. So art consists of the four fundamental forms, song, dance, design, and storytelling. Um, and so to explain the evolutionary account of storytelling, he has to go one level more general and explain the evolutionary account of art itself. Yeah, so let's ask, so Boyd is, you know, putting forward this evolutionary account of art and storytelling in particular, but a reasonable question, and one that, upon reflection, I myself might have given. I'm honestly not sure if you would ask mm -hmm. me before reading his book, like, what I would have said, but there are non-evolutionary accounts of art out there. So, like, why do you have to appeal to biology? So, one common position is just, like, it's a purely cultural phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? So, like, it had, there's you don't need to go to the level of evolution to explain it. It's just, like, cultures where humans, we do interesting things, etc. Um, and, well, and so, so, to say a few words in defense of this, like, art is, and literature as well, can be very culturally specific. So there's no doubt, for instance, that there's such, an, uh, such a thing as like Japanese styles of mm -hmm. painting or um, like Native American wood carving style, right? So mm -hmm. d different cultures certainly do have like different forms of art sort of inherent to that culture that they have developed. And so you might think like, oh, an evolutionary account is sort of overreaching, right? It, it, these things are not a common thing. And so we should just be analyzing each culture independently mm -hmm. and asking like why they do this, right? Maybe it gives people status, et cetera. But what this misses is that, like, while it's true that art is shaped by culture, the specific forms of art, it doesn't answer the question why all cultures engage in art and storytelling specifically, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to ask the broader question, like, okay, well, art is this weird thing that takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort. So why is it common, even though the specifics of it might be different across cultures, but why is it common to engage in this thing? Um, that serves no like obvious advantage at, at the beginning. Um, and so, so that sort of fit like the ultra as cult, uh, the art as culture phenomenon sort of fails at that level, right? It's clear that like, because like everyone, every tribe ever has engaged in like storytelling, like m moms telling stories to their kids, um, people painting, people dancing, people singing, obviously, you know, we need to, we need to go one level deeper basically. Okay. Yeah. I won't go, I won't go on for too much longer, but sort of the next I would say broad category of thesis is just that art is serving some useful purpose in society. So like it, it's non-evolutionary, it's not, wasn't evolutionary adaptive, but it's just like, it's serving a useful purpose. So this might, this is maybe like art as functional type of theories, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so some, some sub brands of this are like mimetic theories. So art just represents the world. Um, and so it's sort of like a map of the territory, et cetera. Um, this kind of fails because it has trouble explaining anything that's too abstract. So like what exactly mm -hmm. in the world is music representing? What is abstract art representing? What is abstract mathematics for that matter representing? Yeah. Right. So yeah. the, the relation there, it's like that. So it fails for that reason. Um, expressive theories, which say that this is just like the artists have a desire to express themselves. Um, this is maybe true, but sort of tautological. Like why do they have a desire to express themselves and why specifically are they, um, expressing themselves in these specific art artistic forms like everything you do is sort of an expression of yourself <laughs> what you want to do yeah. so like, why these particular forms um and then the last one is sort of like communicative theory so it just helps us communicate various ideas um but again you need to be more specific you need to ask why art we have the ability of speech we can just talk to one another right so if all we wanted to do is express ideas it doesn't seem like we have to engage in again music uh dance 
uh, storytelling, et cetera, myth, right? So we it, like these things that are not true, that are just weird abstract representations of the world. It doesn't answer um, why we need to do that. And so yes. he basically goes through these and then says, okay, it's sort of clear we need to, because these are common across all cultures and we're doing these weird things that take a lot of time and energy, we need to sort of start giving evolutionary accounts of art. Um, at one point in the book, uh, Boy gives like a synthesis of like six reasons why there is a need for an evolutionary explanation of art. And I just want to quickly run through these because I thought they were, they were great. Um, and so, so some of this will uh, overlap with what Ben just, just said, but I think it's a useful uh, summary. So one, it's a universal in human societies. Uh, two, it's persisted across several thousand generations. Three, despite the vast actual and possible combinations of behavior in all known human societies, art has the same major forms. And these are the four forms. So music and dance, manual creation of visual design and story and verse. So the four forms keep reemerging. Mm. Um, it often involves a high cost in terms of time, energy, and resources. Um, it stirs strong emotions, um, which are evolved indicators that something matters to an organism which is a great point. And six, it develops reliably in all normal humans without special training, unlike purely cultural products such as reading, writing, and science. So the fact that it emerges early in individual development with young infants responding to special pleasures to lullaby and spontaneous play with colors, shapes, rhythms, sounds, words, and stories particularly supports evolutionary against non-evolutionary explanations. And also to this ad, um, it naturally emerges in the ways that parents engage with young children where parents will naturally speak to their child in kind of a sing-songy, lullaby, lilty way, uh, which have been called proto-conversations, uh, and which somewhere Boyd says could aptly be described as multimedia performances because they involve the use of hands and face, uh, facial expressions and songs and lilt. And like, George is just going to daycare now. Um, and the teacher sings everything to their kids. Are you listening? Yes, we're listening. Um, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but this is, we just see this as normal, but this is so interesting that uh, children naturally respond to like song and lullaby. That is so interesting. Um, yeah, no, uh, which which uh, strongly indicates evolutionary proclivities towards these four fundamental um, forms. Um, so I think that uh, just is begging for an evolutionary explanation. And I don't know how you want to present this, but I kind of want to present uh, Boyd's stuff first and take our time with it, and then afterwards present the alternate theory. So the, al the two major alternate evolutionary accounts, one comes from Jeffrey Miller, which basically says art is all about sexual selection, um, and the other comes from Pinker, uh, which basically says art is just like auditory cheesecake. It's just an evolutionary spandrel. It's just something we engage in by accident. Um, and the reason I want to discuss them later is because... Boyd would say, and I agree, <laughs> that uh, there's truth to both of what Pinker and um, Miller express. Uh, it's just that they, they can't explain everything. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I prefer thinking about Pinker and Miller after I had a good understanding of Boyd's theory, because then Pinker and Miller kind of add a couple extra details to Boyd, which, um, mm -hmm. which plugs some of the gaps, but, um, but definitely don't do a full, full accounting. So unless you uh, have a strong feeling otherwise. Um, I, no, that sounds good. That's, it's actually interesting that you say that. I was under the impression that Boyd was, um, that yeah, like Miller's theory was definitely had some explanatory power in terms of where art mm -hmm. came from, that, but, but that Pinker basically missed the boat, that he just like, hmm. his account didn't really stack, didn't add much and like only considered art from the consumer's point of view, not the producer's mm. point of view. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so we can, we can get into that stuff, but um, I think my sense is that he's more... He, he definitely acknowledges that Miller's theory has some explanatory power in terms mm -hmm. of why we explain art and also like make some predictions, some of which, not all of which are like born out in practice. So there's definitely something there to Miller's theory. Yeah, no, um, I, I think you may be right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So any more throat clearing that we should make before we actually start explaining the details of the theory? Well, it depends. It depends what you mean by throat clearing. Like I thought maybe we could start by talking about just general play in so not not diving to like storytelling Ooh. and art specifically but just talking about play in humans and also but just other animals ah, and like okay what sort well, so of this is that serves. so okay so this is great so this actually is gonna highlight maybe the different ways that you and i are thinking about this okay, um interesting because uh, i guess the one last thing i want to say and i should have said this earlier um we're going to be primarily referring to two works from boyd uh, so his book on the origin of stories um, is where he lays out his theory in, in great detail. But I prefer a lecture that he gave in which we will link to the book in which the lecture is contained. So the book is titled Stalking uh, Nabokov, 
where he gives a bunch of lectures on Nabokov. And one of the lectures, chapter 11, titled Stacks of Stories, Stories of Stacks. Um, And buried in this lecture is maybe a nine-page summary of his whole thesis. And it's some of the most information-dense paragraphs I've read in (laughs) in a long time. And he gave this as an audio, like as a verbal lecture. So the poor uh, listeners could not have fully... Um, grokked all of the the wonderful details of his theory but um but so i'm primarily drawing on his summary of his theory from this this work okay um, interesting whereas i'm primarily looking at the book so yeah okay <laughs> yeah okay so this so this will maybe uh uh be some useful tension in the way that we're thinking about it but from my perspective um this the account of art doesn't start from play but starts from um the fact that we're a very social species so the the emphasis on being social is where I think the entry pointed is. Mm, um, interesting. But maybe, like, I think you could probably enter in both places, but at least um, I find that found that to be a compelling place to begin. So I don't know. So we can start from both both perspectives. But uh, okay, I, how about this? Let's just let's stop hiding the ball. Let's just give yeah. <laughs> people the theory. Let's give an overview of the theory, and then we can get more detailed as warranted, and also talk about the background as warranted. Because yeah, I see. I see starting from play as like almost like foundational. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. you, you give it a, a high overview of the theory and then, and then um, we'll, we'll dive into the details. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's we're Okay. I'm, I'm going to give a literally a minute overview of the theory just so we can get people roughly in the arena in which we're discussing. And then we can, then we can drive more into details. So I would say at a very high level, his thesis is that art is adaptive because it allows us to play with pattern. And pattern is important because the world is not random. It is not chaotic. It is patterned. And it is patterned in all sorts of ways. So it is patterned like physically from like where we'd like to live, what sort of habitats we look for. Um, and specifically, it's patterned socially. And so information is not random. The world is information dense. And so trying to understand this information, understand all the sorts of patterns and information that go along, go, um, that go on around us is adaptive. And so his broad thesis is that we enjoy and create art to play with pattern and to better understand pattern. And fiction is a specific sort of art in which we play with social information, social Mm -hmm, pattern. mm -hmm. So it allows us to explore situations, to develop intuitions for how people will respond, to understand other people and how they will react to other situations, to various situations by basically exploring idea space. Fiction is exploring idea space so that we can basically get a better understanding of people, of events, of situations, of information generally. That, and that, that is what is adapted. But now go into the play component. So you've talked about the pattern component, but why is play so important? He asks leadingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, th- I think a good place to start is with either children or other mammals. And so children and other mammals are known to play physically. You imagine like two like little boys and girls sort of wrestling, et cetera, or like, like baboons, monkeys, et cetera, when they're young sort of wrestling with one another. And what this does is allow them to test their strength, understand the limitations of physicality, et cetera, in sort of a secure environment where they can learn like how to how things work so that if they come into like a situation where they need to be physical in in the real world, they understand how things work better. So it's basically like a proto form almost like learning how to fight in some sense. So I'm thinking of like rough housing and stuff here. Exactly. Well, so he, he gives a couple examples of how rough and tumble play and tag and chase are proto forms of fight and flight. Um, and you could also add to this, like playing doll and playing uh, exactly. Barbies yeah. and stuff is, is proto forms of like uh, nurturing and taking care of uh, and parenting and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so in moments of security, animals who practice these behaviors will be better adapted and able to use them in moments of high urgency. And and that's why evolution has endowed us with this feeling of play being fun. Because if it wasn't fun, we wouldn't naturally engage in it in off times. And so the very fact that it's fun encourages children to engage in this behavior Hmm. thus uh, expending a lot of energy and resources to practice skills that will be needed uh, as they develop. 
Um, and he also makes the point that human beings have the longest childhood of any species uh, mm. in proportion to the span of their life. So he made a comparison to the bowhead whale, which is about many times our size and can live for hundreds of years. And the bowhead whale um, has roughly the same length of childhood, so to about 25 odd years. So for the bowhead whale, childhood lasts about 10% of their lives, but for human beings, childhood lasts about 25% of our lives. And so that just indicates how much uh, practice we need. But because we are primarily a social and uh, information and cognitive species, the thing that we want need the most amount of practice playing with are um, ideas from social life and ideas uh, in, in information space. And so although we do the rough and tumble play, um, we also need to be playing with um, uh, ideas that which will uh, prepare us for social life. Uh, yeah. And that's where you start getting the uh, beginnings of, of the need for fiction. So yeah, a good evolutionary accounts should be predictive. And what would this predict? This would predict that kids left to their own devices would start playing on their own, right? Without like indications from adults about how to play or what to play, etc. And this is indeed what you see, right? Kids are like experts at coming up with games with one another. It's, and human, you know, human kids in particular, like come up with games that are like fiction based where you pretend to be yeah. something, I'll pretend to be something else. Um, and so it's not only wrestling, etc. It's just playing with information. So I'm just going to read a paragraph that I think is particularly clear from Boyd. This comes from the essay. So he says, we crave information. But because we have a more, a much more open-ended curiosity than other animals, we have a special appetite for pattern. We crave the high yield of novel kinds of pattern. So we not only chase and tussle, we not only play physically, but we also play cognitively with patterns of the kind of information that matter most to us. Sound, sight, and in our ultra social species, social information. We play with the rhythm and pitch and shape of sounds in music and song with colors and shapes and drawing and painting and mud pies or sandcastles, and with patterns of social information in pretend play and story. In the social world, we see patterns of identity, personality, and society. In the world of events, we see patterns of cause and effect. In the world of social events, we see patterns of intention, action, and outcome. Yeah, okay, so this is great. So I really want to talk about the social aspect, because when I first... Um, read the theory, I was drawn towards the play component. And then upon rereading, I thought that the social component was a bit more fundamental. Oh, and so I think you're better than me. All right. I see what you're <laughs> no, so, but, anyway, so obviously they're both hugely important, but let's talk about the social components a bunch. The thing which I thought was really fascinating is that he starts from a very simple premise. The premise is that human beings are extremely social. Um, and that seems like self-evidently true, but Think about what this involves. So he makes a compelling point that it is much more cognitively demanding to cooperate with a, another member of your species than it is to uh, compete with a number, uh, another member of your species. So if you think about like two runners competing, mm. uh, you don't really, they don't really need to communicate all that much. They just need to conceal the fact that they're training um, and work on improving them themselves. Um, similar with like academics competing, um, typically and not always, but typically competition involves much less communication and much more concealment um, mm. compared to uh, cooperation, where uh, to cooperate, you need to intensely engage with another person. You need to know in detail what the others you wish to cooperate with know and plan. You need to play uh, close and continuous attention to what others are seeing, feeling and doing. So in order to cooperate effectively in a highly social species, you have to begin developing a theory of mind. Um, and you have to be able to uh, understand that what Ben does will be a function of what Ben believes. And so you can test this in children where uh, children at a very young age, given the doll experiment, like a doll sees like a, mm -hmm. an object to go into a box and then the doll leaves and then somebody moves the object out of the box and then the doll comes back in. Um, and then the question is, does the doll think the object is in the box? Um, uh, I might be getting the details wrong, but, um, but in order to cooperate effectively, we need to start thinking about things like what does Ben think Charles thought about Zed's actions? Um, and we can just effortlessly track X's reaction to Y's reaction to Zed's thoughts about A. And we can do this almost automatically. And so it kind of is not seen as the mystery that it should be seen as. But this is evolution giving us the capacity to cooperate with other people. Uh, mm -hmm. And that naturally involves the capacity to um, take the viewpoint of another person 
to imagine what it must be like to be that other person and to kind of uh, run the simulation of pretending to be in situations that you, you aren't yourself in. So you can see already there, you start getting the uh, hints of where storytelling is going to come in. But what I really like about this is it comes with a really nice conclusion. And the conclusion is that once I understand that you, Ben, can have a false belief about something, then it's a quick hop away to realizing that I can have a false belief about something too. Mm. Um, and once I realize that I can be missing a key piece of information, then I have this realization that I might not know enough, that I might need to understand something better, that I might need to um, uh, gain more information, that I need to seek out more. Um, and so from this notion of cooperation comes theory of mind, but then from theory of mind comes an innate sense of curiosity and of wonderment and of seeking out more information that you currently have. Um, and so what he's giving here is an evolutionary explanation of the emergence of human curiosity, without which we wouldn't have uh, science or philosophy or storytelling to begin with. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we don't just tell stories, but we actively um, seek to learn stories from other people. Uh, so it's not just enough to talk about um, why we tell stories and why we like to play with stories, because it could be the case that people play with pattern in isolation, right? Um, there's nothing about playing with pattern that necessarily says we have to do it in a social way, but a huge component of art is the fact that it's so social. And so that's why I think the social component is key because that's what explains why we uh, seek out information in the first place. Um, because we want to be able to engage with other agents. And also from that comes the realization that we might ourselves be misinformed and we need to learn from other agents and uh, seek out deeper explanations of, of phenomena and, and, and try to refine our stories so that the false beliefs that we might have, we can uh, do away with. So I just want to add those details about the social component to the story, which I think is, is a key uh, additional um, aspect of the theory. Nice. So it seems like in some sense, the part you've added on there that the sociality that really comes up in the theory with respect to fiction and storytelling, because we're imagining other people in various situations, them having various amounts of information, imagining what it's like to be them, um, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't seem like art specifically is, it doesn't seem like uh, the sociality rather is required for like art generally, right? And this could mm. probably explain why other species also engage in various forms of art, not just humans. So I wouldn't want to make a statement that other forms of art aren't social because music and dance are highly social, right? Art serves the function of bringing groups together and forming like cohesive bonds. Just think about going to like a Spice Girls concert or something. And, and so in that sense, the other forms of art are inherently social as well. Maybe that's a cleaner way to, um, to say it, but the evolutionary function, which they're serving is perhaps different than in the acquiring information to practice our social skills. Like we do in fiction. Does that land or am I being? Yes, yeah, so sort of. It's funny. I think um, I think this is actually where the different emphasis on play, like you're starting from the perspective of sociality, whereas mm -hmm. I like to think of it as starting from the perspective of play. So like other putting aside humans for the moment, many other species engage in physical play. Mm -hmm. And then as species become more cognitive in their abilities, they engage in more more forms of sort of cognitive play, not necessarily like storytelling and fiction. That seems to be uniquely human, but in various forms of art. So for example, like in his book, he talks about uh, the following experiment. So this is a quote. He says, in the 1950s, when Desmond Morris supplied chimpanzees in his care with paint, brushes, and paper, they threw themselves into painting provided they received no external reward. Those who were offered food would make a few perfunctory strokes and break off quickly to seek another tasty morsel. But those whose motivation remained uncorrupted by the payment, quote unquote, developed a fierce commitment to painting. They painted intensely, persisting while the session lasted until they thought a sheet finished, though they would never glance at their work later. So in, like, I feel like that's better explained by starting from the perspective of play. So we have these we have this like inbuilt behavior to want to play with various forms of information around us to understand it better, to learn it better, to learn the kinds of patterns that we come across. Yeah, I feel like that perspective explains why something like chimpanzees, which are they are social, but not nearly as social as we are, engage in like sort of normal forms of art. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I'll retract what I was saying, because uh, that's very persuasive. 
uh, it seems to me there's like different legs of the table and one doesn't necessarily have primacy over the other one because when you go it's hard to figure out what developed first are being social or are playing and it seems like it's probably not worthwhile um trying to figure out which is more more fundamental but just these two components are both both needed but other species play right i guess that's my point yes other species play uh, that aren't as social as us but don't engage in as much art or storytelling as us either but but they have like the for example like a lot of species will like like whales like will sing like so he has this story of like in his essay of like the whale the whale song right where it's like there's almost trends in like what they'll sing like they can pick up something will start in like the you know some pacific ocean and make its way over to the atlantic ocean like they're following some sort of pattern so in that sense Anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll shut up because no, no, <laughs> it's no. like we disagree. But like, I, I feel like that's why I'm so persuaded by the play thing because it, it feels like you can almost well, have so this like, is... evolutionary hierarchy where it's like everyone's playing, and then what you're playing with is then determined by your cognitive niche. And our cognitive niche is so social that the kinds of things we we are obsessed with, the kinds of things we play with, is social information. And that's where like the fiction and the storytelling and the advanced forms of art come in. Um, but because other species aren't as aren't as cognitive, aren't as social, they play with uh, yeah, but, sort of f- yeah, le- f- uh, more basic forms of information. Yeah, but if it was just that, then the stories we would be telling would mainly involve gossip and involve characters that we know, right? Uh, it wouldn't involve these elaborate stories of outer worlds and dragons and amazing, crazy creatures and space monsters. Um, and gods and demons. But if our capacity to be social leads to a theory of mind, which leads to the realization that we might not know enough, um, then we'll want to start playing with information that is far beyond just our own social uh, milieu. We'll want to be playing with information that is many, many distant galaxies away, because this is part of our insatiable appetite for information and our curiosity and our desire to not be mistaken and our desire to learn and and teach. Uh, And so it seems like if it was the playing only with the stuff that was immediately in our social environment, then our, uh, the kinds of stories we would be telling would be um, limited in scope to uh, our immediate surroundings. Whereas if our desire to play with information comes from uh, the realization that we may have mistaken beliefs, then we're going to be playing with stories at a much grander, wider scope. But but again, I, I'm not trying to argue one is necessarily deeper than the other. I just think that it's hard to disentangle what makes human beings unique. Is it the fact that we have a longer childhood? Is it the fact that we like to play more? Is it the fact that we're more intensely social? Well, I think all of these kind of come in together to fuse, to create our proclivity to tell um, uh, wonderful and fantastic stories about uh, things that are very far away from our immediate social environment i mean, I disagree with your critique but i'll, I'll yeah. i feel like i don't want yeah i don't want to get too sidetracked yeah. on this because i mean i agree with the general point like yeah like it's it's adaptive for us to be able to think and play with ideas that are like very far removed from our from our immediate social environment yeah i agree okay, so um in the way that i had these notes uh so i like that we have taken notes differently um i, I just want to maybe do a little bit of summarizing at this at this stage yeah let's yeah let's um do. because initially like at the beginning of the introduction I pose the puzzle of why does a species play so often with fictional information that she knows to be false? Why haven't we evolved a resistance to to fiction and only tell stories that we know to be true? Um, and so Ben has answered this, uh, and I, but I just want to summarize that for the audience. The, so the answer is that we're playing with cognitive information, uh, which allows us to better understand the nuances and the subtleties of both social life, but also the environment as a whole. So you can imagine a lot of like religious stories told about do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. If you embed that into a story about a God who's going to smite you, if you act poorly, well, that'll have a lot of social benefits. And, uh, and so you can uh, see that stories and storytelling allow you to play with information, practice the, the skills of understanding that A said B to C, who thought D about E. But also it can convey uh, useful information, which because our mind is so naturally used to dealing with narrative, our mind can understand that information in a bit, a bit cleaner way. And so that's why there's an evolutionary advantage to, to telling uh, information that we know, know to be false. Yeah, so I guess I just wanted to tie a bow on the answer to the question that was proposed earlier. 
Are there any other um, things you think should be included in that particular summary? Uh, so, yeah, perhaps what, what was useful for me with art in particular, uh, not necessarily storytelling in uh, specifically, was that at some point he uses the word supernormal stimulus for art, mm. which I think he just means like a super stimulus. So like, you know, we're in our the in- environments in which we evolved. Um, we're sort of craving these patterns. Um, and then we can see like art, whether it's like paintings, dance, music as sort of like super stimuli in which we coalesce these patterns in like vibrant, sharp ways. And we become very interested um, in what they have to say. So it's almost like taking things that um, existed naturally in our environments that we were interested in and then coalescing them in clever ways and things that like can't help but grab our attention. So this would be like um, cheesecake coalescing sugars and fats in a very pleasing way to be a super stimulus on the tongue. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. An example of what a super stimulus might be. Yeah. Broadly, it's like we evolved to want something and then we invent ways to get that thing in like very purified quantities. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying certain forms of art are like that. And like, like you said, like in the, in the space of food and sugar, We've like taken this desire for sugar and then we can distill it into like almost like, you know, desserts that are almost pure sugar. Yeah, that's so the, in that sense, art is like a super stimulus. So we've talked a lot about art, but I don't think we've fully explained the unique interest in storytelling. So other animals engage in art. So like you said, whales engage in song. Uh, chimpanzees can engage in painting. Bees have their little bee dance. Um, but, uh, only humans tell stories and that's because there's one, uh, form of pattern, which is particularly important in human society. And that's the pattern of agents and agency. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple quotes. So our minds are finely tuned for understanding agents, any creature that can act animal, human, or even by extension, unseen agents like, uh, spirits. In ancient environments, the agents we evolved to track were other animals, as well as people. And even in modern urban environments, and this is so true when when you realize when you have a daughter, um, children have a compulsive desire to learn the names of animals and play or attend to stories with animals. Um, Mm -hmm. But they don't have that same desire to learn buildings that previous architects have made. Like There's a unique fixation with animals and with dinosaurs. And that makes uh, perfect sense because our minds um, want to and easily can track and differentiate agents uh, since agents, human or not, offer the most complex, volatile, and high stakes information we regularly encounter. So agents are very important. He goes on, he says, uh, so very young children do not readily think offline away from the here and now. They do not easily recall the recent past but they can easily use the present props of toys, whether homemade or manufactured, to conjure up scenario, scenarios involving agents that hook their attention. Uh, they learn to think in a sustained fashion in ways decoupled from the here and now, uh, first by using physical props as fellow agents, then gradually by raiding the ready-made stories and characters of their culture. By building up on our sociality, fiction stretches our imagination, taking us from the immediate present along tracks we can easily follow offline, because they're the fresh tracks of agents. So what's interesting to me is um, when humans set about to try to understand phenomena, the way that they did that typically was involving agents. So why is there lightning? um, And why do my Mm -hmm. uh, children get sick? Uh, Because of Zeus and because of Yahweh being upset with with, with us. Um, But notice that, so like, uh, I think Boyd somewhere talks about like your house gets termites and it falls down and people wonder why initially the story is going to involve agents. Um, but the agents never replace the physical explanation. The story is always the agents caused Mm. the termites to cause the house to fall down. So the invocation of agents is always one layer deeper, one layer uh, beneath the surface. Um, that is a cause of the cause. It's, it's, it's the thing that causes the proximal cause. Um, and this is how we first started to think beyond the immediate. And this is our first grapple at uh, deeper explanations of the world. Um, and so much of what science has had to do is wrestle away the agent uh, explanation mm-hmm. and replace it with a physical but deeper explanation of the cause of the thing that we're trying to explain. So 
in the fact that we were naturally predisposed to gravitate towards agents uh, led us to start looking for deeper explanations to the physical phenomena, which then over time led us to do away with the agents and start seeking deeper explanations of, of reality around us. Mm. And so that's how you can kind of run this through line from Georgia knowing like 20 to 25 different animal sounds right now to the scientist looking for the explanation for the speed of light. Um, and uh, it's just this cool way that fiction offers the bridge between uh, between between that uh, first through agents, then by getting rid of the agents and trying to replace it with a deeper non-agential explanation. So I, I just thought that was really neat. Uh, and that directly explains why we like to tell stories involving protagonists and antagonists because the agential information is the most complex, volatile, and high-stakes information in, in our uh, prehistoric environment. Yeah, nice. Like, this theory gives you things to study, which is what I like yeah. about it. So, for example, you know, it like, art in general, because it, like, compels our attention, and his claim is, like, this, basically, by studying art, by thinking about art and fiction, it should improve, like, why are we doing this? Because it helps our pattern detection, Right. Mm -hmm. In the case of fiction, like social and agential patterns and stuff like you were saying in, in art more generally, just more general forms of pattern. And this is something we can study. So we can study like when people, if they've you know paid more attention to certain kinds of art, et cetera, if they've read more, et cetera, are they better pattern detectors in those mm -hmm, kind of mm -hmm. realms? Um, and so surely someone who knows about like, you know, more about M MRIs and all that sort of shit you'd look for in the brain. Like, but this actually gives you something to look for to study and importantly, something to like falsify. And, and it also offers the suggestion that if you have a complex pattern or piece of information to deliver, if you deliver it in narrative mm, story nice. form, yep. it will be more easily digested by the listener compared to, and, and this is just what makes, which seems so writing, true, right? right? Like it's almost so true, obviously yeah. true, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, so he yeah. gives a great example of this in um, in one chapter of his book, and I just think it's kind of funny, but it also does a really nice job of um, explaining what what we mean. So I'm just going to read. So he's talking about a movie, The Naked Lie, with a very unpleasant, self centered character named Webster, hmm. um, and Webster shows no sympathy for a prostitute who has been killed. <laughs> yeah. When Victoria asks him, "What if it were your sister?" he sneers, "I don't have a sister, but if I did, she wouldn't be a hooker." Later in the mo movie, Victoria muses to another character. You know that sister Webster doesn't have? Well, she doesn't know how lucky she is. Um, okay, kind of cute. But think about what's going on. So we easily follow Victoria's initial counterfactual, Webster's counterfactual refutation of her con condition, and Victoria's comedic, contradictory, counterfactual consequence. <laughs> um, the sister who, because she does not exist, cannot know how lucky she is, um, cannot know how lucky she is not to do so if she had to suffer Webster as her brother. And so stories allow us to explain, uh, to understand like actuality, counterfactuals, contradictions, and combinations thereof in an effortless, effortless acknowledgement of a joke. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just quite wild to think about all of the, the layers of what has to go on to comprehend uh, something as simple as, as that, that joke. Yeah. And uh, and it just goes to show how effortlessly we digest um, information when put in narrative form and um, why, for example, some of the ideas Deutsch talked about were best delivered through the mouth of Socrates mm -hmm. or why um, Yukowski, his fictional writing and his literature on um, Harry Potter and, and the art of rationality or whatever it's titled can be so compelling for people uh, because it's not conveying this information in a dry sterile way it's, it's putting it into a yeah. literary device um and and i just think that's a really a powerful uh, technique which uh we should adapt more often yeah yeah time to write a fiction book for statistics <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah um so okay what so what do you think about this prediction that like we should be more compelled by fiction than other forms of art in general and I think that's probably true if you just think of like how much people like TV and movies, yeah, like exactly. think, think how much of a super stimulus that is, right? You're just like yeah, yeah. a movie, you're seeing someone's often like internal battles, internal thought process yeah. without suffering any sort of risk of like you're yeah. going to be discovered, right? You're just like looking at them, seeing exactly what's happening in private, in public. This is like the ultimate sort of social 100%. information that you can think to get. Yeah. And there's like a reason people love watching movies. And I would... Yeah think that people like books and movies more than they like art 
in general like it, like fine art for example or like modern art for example well, well i think um, music would be the one competitor um mm. I, I think music is is very popular but i yeah like i think there's probably no competition between the amount of time people spend watching tv compared to the amount of time people spend listening to to records uh, obviously this doesn't hold for everybody um but but i think yeah it's yeah. like tv and then like fiction and nonfiction, probably in that, in that order. Yeah. Music's a bit of an outlier. Um, I think yeah. music has the benefit of being very emotionally powerful. Uh, so uh, you can, you can get shivers down your spine listening to like uh, a five minute um, piece, uh, mm-hmm. obviously by Dave Matthews, because that's what you <laughs> listen to. <laughs> but um whereas uh movies and television take take uh much longer to 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 get there um so there's maybe something about the immediate emotional delivery system of music which um which makes it compelling but uh but even still i wouldn't say that music compares to television in the amount of time people spend uh, consuming it um and then like visual art and design is probably further down the the line as well but there, oh, i guess there's another point that is relevant here is that storytelling was likely the last of the major art forms to evolve. Mm-hmm. So you had uh, chanting and rhythmic movement and rock stick or rock banging, which correspond to proto song, proto dance and proto instrumental music, likely stretching back million plus years. Um, and then you could see early signs of visual art uh, dating back a hundred thousand years by, for example, over refining hand axes for purely aesthetic reasons. So you can look at an old tool and realize that the tool has been designed past the point of functional value and purely to be like symmetrically appealing. And so uh, language adequate for telling stories seems to have dated back only 100, 100 or 150,000 years, meaning music maybe reaches deeper back into our evolutionary roots than mm. storytelling does. Um, and that might explain some of the reason why music has, has an appeal. Like with the design thing, you could definitely say that fashion is a huge um, component of art and people dress themselves in, in visually appealing ways. And I think it's, it would maybe be hard to figure out why do people engage in more like dressing nicely or watching television. But mm. clearly a lot of our daily activities are spent uh, engaging in both behaviors. Um, right. And so maybe that can partially be explained due to the uh, how far back into the evolutionary history it goes. Oh, one one interesting thing in his book, he uh, talks about this little, this is a small little study, which I thought was interesting, but I haven't actually looked at the study or whether it's been replicated, et cetera, et cetera. But he, he cites this study of sociopaths in Texas. And hmm. he said, basically, they couldn't find anything. And they were looking for like, what causes sociopathy? And they basically couldn't find anything in common except for a severe lack of play as hmm. kids. And so this might suggest that like, not only is it beneficial for us to play when we're younger, if we don't, if we sort of like are suppressed in that way and not allowed to do that, it has like severe consequences on our development as we get older. Hmm. Like as if we hmm. haven't, hmm. I don't know, I don't know what the causal mechanism there would be from, from that, from lack of play to murder. But it does yeah. suggest that like, perhaps it's so natural for us to play that like if we're stunted in those sorts of developments, we develop like yeah. a lot of antisocial type behavior. So that's just like one flag that yeah. I would like, I would like someone to like, you know, Scott Alexander can maybe write an essay on that. That would be nice. Yeah. Because <laughs> like even the most neglectful and shitty parent wouldn't actively stop their child from playing because playing is when their kids just not bothering them, you know? Mm. And so they'll just let them play in the, in the corner right, of the room. Yeah, exactly. But I'm sure there are very rare circumstances where, like a um, parent is actively like maliciously trying to damage their, their child um, and uh, prevent them from, from playing. And like, obviously you could never even study this because it would just be so um, immoral to, to do, but maybe you could study this in rats or something. Um, but, but yeah, it seems plausible that that would be a cause of psychopathy for sure. Also, perhaps it has interesting, like it seems like over the course of human history, our childhoods, um, if not physically have gotten longer, they've gotten longer in terms of, just how long we expect people to act as kids. Hmm. So like in the relatively recent past, not on any sort of evolutionary time scale, kids had to like basically be adults by like 12 or 13. They were like working mm-hmm. on the farm. They oh, were doing things. Point, right? Yeah. And so yeah. this totally 
right now they have like real responsibilities they got to look after their parents their parents are dying when they're like 30 40 right this like yeah. really shortens the human lifespan and obviously prohibits you from like playing more when you're yeah. that young like i wonder what sort of, you know it's kind of amazing we've hit this point now that like we can play for so long we can fuck around for so long like, it's kind of it's kind of amazing and you wonder what sort of consequences that had it's almost like the last stage of um adult childhood play involves the maximal amount of play in social environments i.e partying right <laughs> oh yeah interesting <laughs> like uh, partying and and video games where you're playing online with with people mm. um but i'm just going to refer to my my own life like 18 to 29 it's partying pretty hard um and then COVID hit and now we're trying to get back into it but now we have a daughter but um <laughs> but it, but it's, it's interesting that you kind of start playing in a solitary environment then you play with your friends and stuff and then at the end stage um well, maybe you're playing socially as well throughout your teens. So maybe I can't say that, but, um, but it just feels like your play becomes more and more about socializing and less and less about playing sports or playing, being in theater. It just becomes more and more about like what yeah. naturally people find fun pushes us towards this like social thing where you work and then you go play by partying with your friends and then you go work and you go play by partying with your mm -hmm. friends and just become, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it almost seems like socializing is like the final stage of the play development before you're out of your childhood. Yeah. Isn't interesting. That land? yeah also, like, I mean, what that made me think of is that it's interesting that, and perhaps this actually, we'll get into the sexual selection, Joffrey Miller stuff later. Jeffrey Miller. Uh, Jeffrey Miller. <laughs> Joffrey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like the shitty kid from Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting that people seem to be most interested in fiction and fantasy in perhaps mm. their te early teens to teenage years. Mm. And then mm -hmm. when they're like in their 20s, people still like it, but I, I to a lesser extent. And they're probably more interested yeah. in like gossip and those forms of sociality, like yeah. almost like not as much. Well, maybe just yeah. different kinds of fiction. Actually, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Actually, maybe I take it back because maybe people at all times are interested in fiction, just different kinds of fiction. But, but there's definitely you do like associate like fiction, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like he was so yeah. like, yeah. who's watching like the most Game of Thrones, the most Harry Potter, the most Lord of the Rings? Like yeah. you kind of associate that with teenagers and young adults, right? Yeah, yeah. But it, but it, it, it does seem like as people get more socially developed, they play more and more with social information to the point where they're just uh, playing with friends and, and stuff and become and, and that seems like part of healthy development whereas um like you've done your fantasizing is, almost like you yeah. figured you figured those worlds out so you can actually like now focus more on the like the real world yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well and and also like um if your child isn't socialized correctly at a very young age they have a very difficult time catching up because mm. they aren't um it, it's almost like they're they're uh have a little bit of like the tism um, mm -hmm. like they're slightly autistic right. <laughs> and because they can't fully, um, uh, keep up with the, the subtleties of social life. Mm. And then it becomes harder for them to, to, um, adapt. Like, I think Peterson talks about this somewhere, um, that it's just like, it's very important that your, uh, children play with other children at a very young age so that they, uh, continuously learn the social rules of their, of their peer group. Um, and if they fall behind, then it's hard to, to, to catch up. And so there is something about like being socially uh, stunted um, at a young age that makes it difficult uh, and it carries on throughout your your adulthood um okay so there's one thing i really want to talk about nice. after i get a drink yeah okay yeah let's do it <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> you think we've done a good job like do you think people understand the thesis uh, uh should we do a summary you think the quick the very very quick summary is that there's three main ideas play pattern and social species so play allows us to practice skills and downtime that we need later. We're a very social species, so we need a lot of information about social life. But being social also makes us realize that we uh, may not know enough about the, um, the world around us, and so it makes us curious. And pattern information is, uh, is something that we use to understand the world. And so this leads us to an increased interest in playing with the patterns of social life, and this explains our deep interest in fiction and stories. And that's the very high level uh, summary of the, of the thesis. Yeah. And so I think it's like 
great. <laughs> and explain, <laughs> explains, explains a lot. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't the most profound thing. This is an A plus <laughs> thesis. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so he has a chapter or like a part of a chapter on art and creativity. Did you read that uh, chapter? Because that one was, it wait, went past me the first time I read it. But the second time I read it, I thought it was phenomenal because of the word creativity. So the word creativity is basically has been um, annexed by the Deutschian community. And now it just means whatever magical, mystical thing the human brain can do that other things can't do, which is yeah. great. And I've used it that way as well. But, um, but like we kind of forget that creativity and art are deeply related, right? Before we were making stories, uh, theories and philosophy and theorizing about the universe, we were chanting and banging sticks together and engaging in proto forms of art. So I don't think you can really talk about humans' capacity to be creative scientifically or philosophically um, or argumentatively, if you don't in parallel talk about our capacity to um, make art. And so Deutsch has a, re um, Boyd has a really interesting um, discussion about how nature has evolved art to create, create creativity. So the Deutschians would want to say, well, human beings are creative and us being creative allows us to produce artwork, which is obviously true. But you can also kind of flip it and say human beings produce artwork and our proclivity to produce artwork has created our ability to be creative. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not worth arguing about which one is deeper, which one comes first, because they basically, they co-evolved. But I think it is fruitful to flip the lens temporarily and think about our disposition to creating art as enabling our capacity to be creative and see what this line of thinking mm. uh, gets us. Yeah, it's and it's related, I think, to stuff he mentions elsewhere in the book, which is that, so humans create art, which then influences how humans think about art. So yeah, it's not it's a, world it's not a it's one like a, exactly it's yeah. not a one way relationship. It's like you create art, you put these ideas out there, and then they influence um, our ideas, our culture, etc. And again, this harkens back to what I was saying in the beginning: that different cultures have different forms of art, etc. And so yeah. you can see, you can clearly see how different forms of art in different cultures, um, especially with cultures that had limited contact with one another, gives rise to like different behaviors, different patterns, different social norms, etc. So. Um, it's by no means humans create art, end of story. It's humans create art, which then influences our culture and our, all our ideas, which influences the next iteration of art and so on and so forth. And, and it's, just, it's just so clear to me that well before we had science and philosophy, we had art. And so if you want to understand human creativity, as I think we all do, but in particular the uh, Popperians and Deutschians want to, then it's quite fruitful to think about how creativity interacts with our tendency to produce art because um, from there we, we can build on that and then see how creativity allows us to understand uh, how we create explanations and theories and arguments and scientific uh, progress. Um, but so the way he talks about this is so good. And I just can't believe I haven't heard of a Darwin machine before. Do you know what a Darwin machine is? No, no, no. Okay, so the Darwin machine is so goddamn good. Wait, is this in the book? Yeah, it's but in the I book. Just, yeah. I just missed this. Hey, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's a Darwin machine? So a Darwin machine is something which evolution has created, which basically does its own form of mini evolution. So an example is the human immune system. So evolution is all about blind variation and selective retention. Um, and the immune system blindly uh, varies different um, antigens in, in a wide variety of, of possibilities. And the ones which are effective at eliminating pathogens are retained and saved for future generations. And that's how you get immunity. So it's a Darwin machine because evolution has created a system which is engaging in the evolutionary process itself. The eye would not be a Darwin machine because it's not engaging in selective variation and retention. It's performing a single function, right? Um, so another example of a Darwin machine is the brain and the mind, right? Where the brain, um, overproduces and selectively retains synaptic con uh, connections. Um, and the mind obviously generates a whole bunch of different ideas, but not necessarily randomly, right? In the, so he actually links to a study, which talks about how there's randomness in the, the, uh, the brain, but even in like Darwinian evolution, there's random mutations, but the mutations are always mutating from a previous state, which is been beneficial up until then yeah. so it's not fully random either 
it's always randomly iterating on the previous best solution. Yeah. Uh, and you could say that the brain and the mind are doing something like that as well. Maybe not. But, but OK, random. I get the I get the gist. Yeah. So that's the concept of a Darwin machine. And so Boyd says that our proclivity for art is another Darwin machine. Um, it's an evolutionary subsystem, which is effectively designed in this case to create creativity. So just as the immune system is a Darwin machine that produces resistance to pathogens and the brain um, and art in particular is a Darwin machine that produces the ability to be creative. But he hasn't explained, he hasn't given reasons for this yet. That's just his thesis. So again, we just have to remember that art came before science, philosophy, and theories, and arguably before even fire. So you had proto-dancing, proto-song, and proto-instrumental music. And so that's what evolutionary selection pressures are going to be on, um, our uh, tendency to produce these kinds of, of behaviors. Yeah, so he claims that our proclivity to make art serves as a Darwin machine for producing creativity. So what is his argument for this? So you need blind variation and selective retention. So the blind variation obviously comes from inside the mind, but it's not enough to just have an imagination because an imagination is unstable and irretrievable. Art allows the creativity to be retained in an external form. Um, and this is how we move from a purely internal and subjective form of creativity to something external and objective. Um, mm -hmm. This is how we move from the subjective knowledge to objective knowledge, but we're just talking about artwork here. Then the selective retention comes initially from within the mind of the artist, but then through the um, mechanism of capturing and holding the attention of others. So that's the ultimate selection mechanism. So art, which holds the minds of other people, can be retained for millennia, um, but art that doesn't hold the capture the attention of others could, just dies instantly. We don't see it. Crucially, like with biological evolution, you don't just start from scratch every time. So you selectively vary existing and established art forms. So it's quite interesting that over the last millennia, we still have these four fundamental forms of art, where again, design is quite expansive and includes things like architecture and fashion and crochet. But ultimately, we just have this visual aesthetics, song, dance, and story. And because we have these four patterns, this allows the artist to build on what's come before. So building on what's come uh, before underlies all creativity in biology and in science and in mathematics and in culture. Um, and this started in the artistic domain first. Uh, so again, before we, we presumably even had like um, hunter-gatherer cultures, you had individual uh, or maybe pairs of people um, chanting and grunting in, um, in kind of rhythmic song-like fashions. And then crucially, the thing that art brings to the table, so a lot of what I've said could apply to other forms of creativity, so scientific, et cetera. But I think one of the key things that art brings to the table is you have the phenomenon of habituation. So the loss of attention through the persistence or repetition of a stimulus. Um, so if you keep designing the same piece of art over and over and over again, people quickly lose interest. Mm. So if you are trying to capture the attention of others, you constantly have a need to innovate and to create and to develop something new um, because repeating exactly the same thing over and over again guarantees it's going to lose the impact. Uh, and so mm. that's what uh, gives a constant pressure to be novel and to actually create something new. And that comes from, from artwork. Uh, so I think Boyd makes a compelling case that the Darwin machine of artwork uh, is the thing that kind of bootstrapped up our capacity to be creative into something which can then turn into a full-fledged philosophy in science. Because uh, basically we're pressured to be creative by selective, by uh, attention, by yeah, selective exactly. attention. Because like yeah. if we weren't, then people would lose interest. We're, in we're, we're, we're pressured to be creative. Specifically, we're pressured to create new things, to be innovative, to be novel, because right. the uh, habituation uh, and the desire for attention requires novelty, which is why I think after ChatGPT <laughs> gets widely, yeah. widely used, um, it's going to be pretty easy to find those forms of writing that can't come from ChatGPT. Um, and that's what 
uh, human beings are naturally going to gravitate towards um, stuff that's just like quite clearly ChatGPT couldn't write. Because I can already tell, yeah. like when someone gives like a paragraph of ChatGPT, you can kind of yeah, tell yeah. it's like it's just too polished. It sounds too much like it's come from a cookie cutter, um, yeah. and and people are going to get habituated to that really quickly, uh, and it's going to innovate or force innovation. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned ChatGPT because I was thinking the exact same thing and. A couple ideas that we've explored on the podcast have sort of inadvertently really shaped my sense of what it would take to get to AGI. And in particular, I think it will really take like an evolutionary lens on developing intelligence. So, for example, like the Hugo Mercier stuff (laughs) really convinced me that reason is, at least in humans, um, really adapted because of like our, you know, our social milieu and like mm-hmm. trying to justify ourselves to others, et cetera. Like and all how good does that play with episode. what we're talking about today? And it too. plays so <laughs> well with this. And then it's like, oh, our creativity is also, right, an evolutionary type adaptivity that came yeah. from our desired pattern of play. It's just, anyway, I just think we're going about it in completely the wrong way, right? Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's interesting what these sort of ideas have done to me. And like, not that ChatGPT, et cetera, is not extremely impressive and like, Induction certainly got us farther than I was expecting, um, mm-hmm. for sure. Like, I've definitely been surprised by how much statistical learning, how far it can get you by just, like, looking mm-hmm. at ma- massive amounts of data. But I'm just, yeah, via these theories from other places, I'm like, uh, it's just going to take more. Th- like, gradient descent is not evolution, right? I think exactly. that's the that's the big misunderstanding that yeah. even Yudkowsky seems to make. Like, he just, he, yeah. he, he, he will make these arguments that, like, well, if evolution can do it, gradient descent can do it. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the important thing is that evolution doesn't have a clearly defined objective function. It's just blindly changing things and seeing what works. Um, yeah. And so, and so there's there's no... So that's what I like this idea of the Darwin machine, right? Because uh, Darwin machines work in circumstances where there is not a right answer, where we don't know in advance what the solution mm-hmm. is. So unlike the I where the eye can be sure that it's going to be operating in the same environment. Um, where the mm-hmm. environment is one that's photon rich, right? Um, the immune system and the mind and our proclivity to art are operating in changing environments. So evolution has endowed us with uh, systems that can evolve as the environment itself evolves. That's why you have these cool subsystems which aren't pre-fit to any one specific mm-hmm. task. Uh, but this is the exact antithesis of anything with gradient descent. Uh, because yeah. by specifying an objective function, you are specifying the task which you want the thing to be good at. Um, and you're all of a sudden, by definition, not in the evolutionary uh, paradigm. Yeah, exactly. um, but, uh, but yeah, the other thing I like about Boyd is that we talk a lot about how these chat GPT systems like, will never create new theories or new knowledge. And I just think Boyd gives a really great example of like what I'm talking about when I talk about a theory or knowledge. <laughs> And this is at the far end of like sophistication and, and depth. Like a theory can be something as simple as a hypothesis about why your child is late from school today. Like it doesn't have to be a grand, mm-hmm. grand new thing, of course. But I just don't see a universe where ChatGPT is ever going to be able to produce something like Boyd has done here, um, yeah, exactly. which is a rich new explanatory theory capturing uh, a huge amount of, of uh, knowledge in the literature and synthesizing it in a new way and uh, building on it and creating a coherent explanation that agrees with all the other good explanations we have about knowledge and society and reason. And I could be wrong, but yeah. like until ChatGPT can do something like this, I'm not worried that it's going to take over the electrical grid and <laughs> turn everybody into uh, slaves. Um, yeah. yeah, okay, so that's the last big thing I wanted to say about Boyd for now. Uh, we should talk about the other theories. Any other things you want to address before we go there, or do you feel good? Maybe I'll just put some stuff on the table, and we can you can yeah. see if you're interested, and we can either talk about it or not. One is how this. There, I think there. He. I don't think he talks about it. At least, like, not in the parts of the book that that I've read thus far. But this does seem to have certain implications for objective theories of beauty. Hmm. So my sense is that most people would claim something like the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's mm-hmm. like a fairly common phrase, right? Which implies the beauty is inherently subjective. So mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. My, be- my beauty might not be your beauty. There are theories of objective beauty, which various people have put forward. Um, David Deutsch being one of them, right? Mm-hmm. So he talks about like, why is the flower beautiful, et cetera. And it seems like Boyd's theory does point more towards 
an objective theory mm-hmm. of beauty in artwork than not because certain types of patterns will appeal to us more than other types of patterns, mm-hmm. right? And be more relevant and et cetera, et cetera, be more useful mm-hmm. to us. Oh, one, 100%. Yeah. Um, well, and I think one aspect, I don't think this captures the entire story, but so, so let me rephrase that. One aspect of objective beauty, which Boyd would hypothesize, is in the ability to retain attention. Um, so the longer you, uh, an object can hold the attention of others, I don't want to say it's necessarily it's more beautiful. Like you could argue certain things are like, uh, or um, Duchamp's uh, fountain, right? Just the urinal that um, mm-hmm. is, is pulled <laughs> off the uh, Marcel Duchamp. So I don't know if you necessarily have to say that's beautiful, but that's definitely held our attention um, for interesting reasons. Um, kind of like the countercultural Dada movement and its relationship with the World War One and all that kind of stuff. But so I don't think attention equal equal b- beauty, but I think that's definitely a component of that which is beautiful tends to be that which will hold uh, people's attention. Um, right. And uh, you can choose that with celebrities or with uh, great works of um, architecture or art. And putting aside the notion of beauty, it would seem to imply that we will sort of converge on the things that we find most interesting as yeah. pieces of art, pieces of music, dancing, et cetera, which yeah. does seem to be true, right? This sort of explains why, like, if you give people a bunch of options, people, of course, there is like certain like cultural elements, et cetera. Yeah. But people, people sort of agree, like who's a bad singer, who's a bad dancer. They might have different favorite singers and dancers, but in general, we will find the same. We will agree like this person is very talented. They're very good, right? This artist is very talented, very good. And we sort of know that like there are people who are bad artists, et cetera. And we, you know, we just. Yeah. Well, then another, another aspect of objective beauty that Boyd would, Boyd's theory would predict or um, hint at would be uh, how, a piece of art plays with pattern. So beautiful objects and beautiful pieces of art would have more uh, sophisticated uh, patternicity to it and be less uh, random and disordered. Um, So here I'm thinking of just the symmetry of a face or if you've read Gotel Escherbach talking about the the patterns and like box fugues, how like when you actually um, analyze the, the music, uh, it's actually doing some really fascinating things with like um, you know, tonal structure and these like mm-hmm. Escher like patterns of constantly raising uh, yeah. in interesting ways. Um, so maybe it's hard to say what exactly is beautiful, but I think it's maybe easier to say what is things that are ugly. Um, and you could say things like uh, ugly things tend to be more disordered with their patterns, have less structure. Um, they naturally won't grab our attention very long because our eye just won't want to stare at it for, for too long. It won't have gone through the selective variation and retention schema. So another thing that Boyd would probably predict is that beautiful objects probably fit more easily into the four pattern or the four fundamental forms of art because mm-hmm. the mind has an easier way to grok things that it already understands, right? Right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. as art becomes further and further away from these four fundamental forms, like if you nail a screw into a, a piece of drywall and attach some a band-aid to it and call that modern art it's not clear if it's like design or music or so it doesn't fit into the pattern very well um and so the mind kind of doesn't uh, grok it as much so i think there's definitely ways that we can start tackling what objective beauty means and this gives us uh, a number of um, avenues into that yeah actually the high like the the different kinds of pattern have you heard of like uh, john stuart mill's uh, distinction between higher and lower forms of pleasure no no so one thing i've been interested in oh, for a while no, is like i have heard about this yeah um but continue so, yeah so right he is like a famous utilitarian but he made the distinction between higher and f- lower forms of entertainment and pleasure mm-hmm. basically and so i th- you know a modern example might be like binge watching a tv show is sort of lower entertainment versus mm-hmm. like reading a book is a mm-hmm. higher form of entertainment right and so you can agree or disagree whether this um, differentiation actually makes any sense. There's certainly arguments on, on both sides. And for me personally, they're like, is, I feel like there is something to that distinction. Like I do feel differently. I feel like the Deutschians would want to say like, whatever you're tr- doing with your attention, it's for a reason. You have some implicit mm-hmm. theory about why you should be doing it. Like watching game of Thrones is like equally good. as like reading, uh, mm-hmm. like, you know, reading Popper or whatever, mm-hmm. but there, it, it does seem like in terms of like what fulfilled you at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. I do get more lasting fulfillment out of like sort of reading a novel and Mm -hmm. grappling Mm -hmm. with the ideas than I do about like binge watching game of Thrones. Right. For sure. Yeah. Part of me is like wondering if the reason for this is 
that like if you're binge watching t- these types of shows, they tend to have like more simple patterns hmm. than novels or something. And so hmm. he, so B- Boyd has this quote about Shakespeare where he says, Shakespeare offers such immediate patterns, but incorporates others that emerge at different rates and levels from the local in- and linguistic and linguistic like his attention catching deviations from standard English phrasing or the ry- rhythms of his iambic pentameter or the idiosyncratic stamp of his character speech, false ass largesse, how's nimble minded quickness, hotspurs, fiery gallop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to larger scale patterns of character, scenic contracts of image, idea or structure. Anyway, so the idea is like some stories have have like different levels mm-hmm, of pattern. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if this is what sort of account accounts for like what I think. Honestly, my sense is that most people would agree like a day spent reading at the end of the day, you feel differently. You feel better Mm -hmm. than you do at the end of a day spent binge watching your favorite show. Even if like each moment binge watching the show felt pleasurable. And so I'm wondering if this has something to do with like levels of pattern, like levels Mm -hmm. of interpretation that are in the work, et cetera. Yeah. I I think it probably does. I guess I would want to challenge a bit because there are definitely some shows which have that level of nuance to it. uh, Yeah, I agree. Um, comes to mind is is Breaking Bad, which I could only get three seasons into until I started having unbelievably bad <laughs> nightmares and had to stop. <laughs> really? Yeah, I got nightmares that were so bad that I like couldn't sleep because Walter White got so into my like subconscious oh, that shit, he just like really? he fucked me. And then Alina had to <laughs> like, honestly, wanted to keep watching the show, and I had to basically read the synopsis of each episode so that I like knew what happened and That's then watch it through like my like, with a laptop and like through. My- <laughs> clenched fingers it was so bad um but there's definitely a lot going on there and he's playing with some dark themes um and then there's a lot of crappy uh fiction right so uh, yep. there's a lot yep. of just yep. like uh smut, smutty fiction which doesn't necessarily get you uh anything so it's not necessarily that, re- that reading fiction is always better than watching tv i think that there is no, something I, yeah, I agree. to do with the fact that when you read a book i think the books that you tend to read tend to be uh have gone through the test of time to a longer degree, and you're more likely to read books that have engaged the mind and hence have uh, stay on the shelves compared to television, which comes and goes uh, at a season seasonal level. So if you randomly grab a, a book off the shelf that's been recommended to you by a friend or uh, that's come from something else that you've been reading, I think there's a higher probability of, of getting something with much richer content because um, it's... it's uh, Stood the it's test been of time. printed. The it's fact that printed. it's been yeah. printed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Compared to television, which you can capture our attention using more salacious means. Like, like the it has to be the force of the ideas and the writing that holds attention in in fiction. But on the screen, you can use gore and you can use smut and you can use um, lighting and and all that. And that is kind of just cheaper ways of holding and gaining your your attention. So I, I think that. Uh, you're likely to be dealing with richer ideas when you when you deal with books over over cinema, but not that's not always the case. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Like, I didn't mean to suggest that it's like, oh, yeah, books are always better than TV. Yeah. Um, I was just, I think people understand that example where you like spend the day watching TV versus For reading sure. a book. You feel differently in it at the end of the day, but I totally agree. There are very sophisticated yeah. movies and not very sophisticated books, but uh, yeah. I feel like this level of patterns thing might be one explanation as to like like why we feel like that. Yeah, like, totally. Grappling with ideas at multiple levels. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, like good works of fiction will grow with you, right? So you read it in your 20s um, and then you read it in your 30s and you're a different person and the book is a different book uh, because you're picking up things at a much different level. Like I got that with with Lolita and I get that with, with uh, Popper. Um, and uh, there's certain authors that you, you don't read, you just reread. You're more sympathetic with uh, Humbert Hubbard in your, in your 30s. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a charming mother. He wasn't so bad. He wasn't that bad. Just that. He's misunderstood. Well, that's what's so deceiving about Humbert Humbert is like he's just so charming and his writing is so good that you, you kind can't of help but him. like him. Yeah, it's yeah, fucking well, crazy. It's like a huge the, psychological trap, man. Well, but. so you are attracted to Humbert Humbert in the same way that he's attracted to Lolita. Uh, mm. It's it's this forbidden object that you're not supposed to draw yourself towards, but nice, yet you nice. do. Yeah, um, and that's just nice. yet another layer is, uh, in symmetry. Uh, I feel like the only other thing we need to discuss to really cover the subject are the competing theories um, and just compare and contrast them. Um, and maybe you have some notes about that. So maybe you want to uh, kick that section section off. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with, so there's two other main evolutionary accounts of art and the origin of art. Uh, as we mentioned previously, one comes from Steven Pinker. One comes from Jeffrey Miller. 
Uh, so let's start with Pinkers because I think yeah. it misses the mark more so than Miller's does. It, it um, impressively missed the mark, I found. Right? right? But, but only because we had Boyd's <laughs> theory to compare against. I think like uh, it's yeah, so in the, um, How the Mind Works, where Pinker puts forth this idea. He starts the book by saying like everything in this book could be wrong, but at least it's a good place to build off of. And mm-hmm. so that's how I see what he's about to say, because yeah, I think nice. it's definitely wrong, but it's a good place to build off of. So in some sense, it's similar that Pinker is attributing to art a super stimulus type of status but he thinks it's basically it's non-adaptive so it came along for the ride and we are purely exploiting art we are exploiting aesthetics um for no direct adaptive reason so art serves no adaptivity so just to to just return to boyd for one second like art and fiction is adaptive because it's allowing us to play with pattern in useful ways and learn things, understand things about other people and the world. Pinker's thesis says we're just producing it because we can. It basically, our ability to produce it came along for the ride. Um, We learned things about the world. We learned how patterns work. And now we can produce it just like we can produce desserts, just like we can produce cheesecake. And so his, you know, his famous line is that art is like mental cheesecake. Um, And so he has an essay uh, about this topic. Um, And there's one particularly clear paragraph that I think I'll just read and then we can riff off of that. So he says, to sum up, I've explored the hypothesis that art, or at least many forms of art, exploit visual aesthetics for no direct adaptive reason. Making and looking at art does not, and probably never did, result in more surviving offspring. There are, to be sure, adaptive explanations why certain visual patterns give human beings aesthetic, intellectual, and sexual ple- pressure. They are cues to understandable, safe, productive, nutritious, or fertile things in the world. And since we are a tool-making, technological species, one of the things that we can do with our ingenuity, aside from trapping animals, detoxifying plants, conspiring against our enemies, and so on, is to create purified, concentrated, supernormal, artificial sources of these visual pleasures just for the sheer enjoyment experienced by both maker and viewer. So there's nothing directly adapted about art, about playing with pattern, etc. We're just doing it because we can, because at this point, we're powerful enough, we can just create art, and it's like, it's a super stimulus, just like mm-hmm. gives us direct pleasure. Yeah, so I, I, Boyd, I think, uh, very conclusively knocks this down in a number of ways. So the first observation he makes, or one powerful observation he makes, is that much Paleolithic artwork so he gives the example of mass de asile in france it's a building i guess um <laughs> it's, it's a carving of a bird turning her head to look at two birds already perched on the turd she is extruding an exquisitely intricate and playful carving that and this is the key point requires far more design skill than producing a spear so the skill required to produce a lot of the ornate work um, that we see in history far exceeds the skill required to produce spears and do the more utilitarian uh, mm-hmm. thing. So if art was just a byproduct of our capacity to make spears and carvings, then we would expect the sophistication of art to exactly plateau at the level of the skill you need to make spears and, and tools. But it's far mm-hmm. more likely that it's the other way around, that a society that's naturally predisposed to develop ornate carvings and artwork could also easily make uh, spears to accomplish their goals. So societies that can produce sophisticated art can make spears, but societies that make spears can't produce sophisticated art. Um, so that does cuts exactly against uh, Pinker's theory. But more importantly, um, Pinker explains the desire to consume art. That's explained by his cheesecake metaphor. But he doesn't explain the desire to produce art. Um, exactly. Because we have a, a an almost unique compulsion to p- expend a huge amount of energy and resources uh, in the production of art. Um, and Picker doesn't explain that uh, at all. He doesn't explain why making art is so fun and why people yeah. will um, dedicate their entire life to making art. And if it was just pure pleasure, he can't explain the fact that much art is takes the form of tattooing scarification and body piercing which causes acute personal pain uh not pleasure it, w- it was precisely that critique that i think flattened the thesis for me was yeah. that he's yeah. explained like the, especially the cheesecake analogy right like mm-hmm. this is something we enjoy not because natural selection specifically adapted us to do so but because we invented it for our own enjoyment and 
it, specifically talking about enjoyment is talking mm-hmm. about people who are consuming art. He just mm-hmm. doesn't deal at all with people who are producing art, but that's the hard part to explain. Exactly. Right? exactly. It, it doesn't actually, it's not very difficult to explain why people yeah. like looking at pretty things, at pretty patterns, et cetera. The question is like, why, yeah, like you said, why are people dedicating so much energy when they could be doing other things um, when, you know, and doing this. And like I said earlier, evolutionary theory would select against that, right? It's predictive in the sense that if there are maladaptive or useless behaviors that are costing us time and energy, natural selection, it will select against that behavior. And so you have to, you have to explain that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Boyd, just to encapsulate the last point. Um, so Boyd says this quite nicely. He's like, if art involved no benefit, if it's only mimicking biological advantage as drugs do by delivering unearned pleasure, yet it had a high cost of time and energy and resources, then a predisposition to art would be a weakness that would long ago have been weeded out by the uh, intensity of evolutionary competition. But it hasn't. It's persisted throughout the times. And that is a strong indication that it indeed confirms evolutionary benefit. And he just concludes by saying that no society lacks art and the most successful societies um, have more art than ever before. Uh, So clearly art serves a function and um, Boyd obviously uh, gives uh, account for what that function function is nice okay i feel like we've dealt with pinker nice. um nice. And, and you're totally right i think there was nothing redeeming about pinker's theory as i said earlier so that's a good good catch yeah very unlike pinker i guess but someone's got to put the he i honestly i actually don't know the chronology so it's it's in fairness to pinker it is possible yeah and you might know like was he the first person to really expound so, uh and a theory of art that came from natural selection, like in a evolutionary well, account of art. Um, how the mind works was it in the nineties? Yeah, but so it definitely predated Boyd. I think there was some reference that uh, Darwin himself commented about art being just a byproduct, but um, but he didn't elaborate that too too much. I guess the only other piece of evidence is that if there was another account of art, then I think Boyd, or, sorry, another evolutionary account of art, I think Boyd would have written about it. So I think we can be fairly confident that. Uh, Pinker's was probably the first attempt at uh, giving an evolutionary explanation, or I guess the, a non-explanation um, for, for art. Uh, but in fairness to Pinker, Boyd's theory involves a lot of moving pieces, and it wasn't available at the time uh, that Pinker was writing. It would be interesting to know if Pinker has updated since since Boyd uh, wrote his book. Um, okay, so let's move on to art as sexual selection, which is Jeff Miller's thesis. So in in a nutshell, this is that you are flaunting your good genes by producing art. So Miller takes, he's basically viewing it from the lens of like signaling theory. So you're producing art because you're signaling uh, resourcefulness, health, and intelligence, basically. Yeah. And he cites other, he cites other instances where beautiful things basically have emerged as a result of sexual selection. So like the most famous example being the peacock's tail. Exactly. Um, but other sorts of things that emerge because of sexual selection, because um, which we should maybe go into what sexual well, selection I think is. One, so. Yeah, well, one important detail of the peacock's tail is um, that its very uselessness, its ornamental extravagance, uh, shows that it's arisen not because it serves some function, but because it has a signaling function. So it's like the very uselessness of the tail is evidence that it's a signaling thing. And so Pinker's going to want to, sorry, uh, Miller's going to want to uh, say mm-hmm. the same thing about art. Art is also equally useless. Therefore, it must serve a signaling function um, a- as evidenced by the fact that uh, you, can't, you can't eat a piece of fiction. Uh, you can't build a shelter out of a drumbeat, uh, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So yeah, so I just wanted to add that detail that it's the uselessness component, which is evidence for its um, signaling function. But then, yeah, maybe the sexual selection you want to go into a bit. Yeah. The idea behind sexual selection is that there's different parental investment between the two sexes in, in their offspring. Um, and so female, <laughs> females are defined as the ones with the larger gametes, as we all know, right? And so, I mean, that happened for various reasons, but that's the base. So the basic idea is females produce fewer but larger gametes, and 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 the larger gametes means they have they put more energy into actually creating the gametes. So they have they have a um, an investment, a larger investment than the males, and so after some logic you work out that this is means that they are choosier the females are basically the choosier spe- uh, the choosier of the sexes um and th- therefore males are sort of competing for their attention and then sexual selection says the males are th- therefore they're producing things in order to satisfy females and this takes the producing this takes various different forms in various different animals and but they're they're competing for the scarce resource 
which is the female, which can choose who she mates with, right? And so males are trying to impress females with various displays um, that showing their health, fitness, resourcefulness, etc. Um, and so this is the basic logic driving sexual selection. And so Miller wants to say, like, art is the way for the males um, to basically show that they are fit and resourceful, etc. to the females. Um, obviously, one thing this is going to predict is that art predominantly comes from males and specifically males that are at sort of a sexually reproductive age, a peak sexual reproductive age. And to, in some sense, this seems to be true. So it does seem to be the case that like across multiple forms of art, there are more males than females. And there are some forms of art for which male investment sort of peaks from late teens to like late 20s and then dies off. But there are certainly forms of art which Boyd goes, which Boyd points out that are just like universal, which like females and males of all ages take part in. And so sexual selection theory, like just can't account for this. Like what, you know, like why is the mother singing to her child, telling her stories? Why are like very young children so interested in playing with one another, with in inventing stories, inventing myths? Um, why are we so inventing, so interested in inventing things about the non real world, right? Like what sort of resourcefulness does that show? And so there are some predictive elements of Miller's sexual selection theory that do seem to be borne out in practice, like namely some of like the gender skew, et cetera. But one, this doesn't account for like all of the skew and two, it just doesn't account for like the wide varieties of art we seem to. Yeah. Well, so I, I would say in general, the prediction that Miller's theory would make is false. And the, the prediction would be that if art were sexually selected, it would predict that it's overwhelmingly male and directed towards females. It develops rapid, rapidly at puberty it peaks just before mate selection, and then it uh, diminishes drastically afterward. And so the forms of art where this can maybe be said to be true would be like music and like rock music in particular, where you have like male lead singers. But uh, that is like one tiny sliver of the vast majority of art. Um, you have Dame Judy Dench, who's female and producing art throughout her entire life. And the vast majority of artists uh, don't stop after um, peak fertility. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, you, ha uh, you can't explain mothers uh, singing to their infants. Um, you can't explain just solitary forms of artistic expression. So a senior making cross stitch patterns in their old age, uh, someone writing poetry that uh, they'll never show to anyone else. Um, so I guess the evidence which Miller uh, uses in support of his theory kind of just, I think, cherry picks, but that's, it's not to say that Miller is totally wrong. Like some art can be definitely used for mm -hmm. sexual exactly. selection. Exactly. And like, like I, I'm sure like Mick Jagger <laughs> and um, uh, like, is, there's definitely a, a sexual selection component. Uh, uh, but it's just that can't explain the vast majority of art. It can explain maybe some art. Uh, and like you could maybe say that throughout tribal societies, like the storyteller perhaps was a higher status in the community and then mated with more females. Um but uh, but I just don't think that captures the the entire phenomenon, just maybe one sliver of it. It also doesn't explain why they were higher status, right? So it seems like you have to do more work to explain, like, why are people so captivated by stories to begin with? Like, what made that person higher status? And then the theory has nothing to say there. So then you still have to revert to, like, what made stories so interesting in the first place? And then that's where you need to resort to something like Boyd's theory. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess um, we talked about Miller and Pinker, because that's who Boyd discussed in his book. But I think we could also add Yuval Noah Harari to the list of um, people who have talked about um, storytelling. So in Sapiens, he talks about the power of stories to unite and cohere a society. So religious myths, even stories like the idea of a currency serves a coordination function. It serves a, um, a group cohesion function. Um, and although he doesn't go back far enough to give an evolutionary account for why we tell stories, he does talk about the the utility of having shared communal stories. And I would just want to add that because I think Boyd does talk about the social cohesive uh, aspect of stories. Uh, he talks about, he's talked about how religious stories serve a role in um, uh, societies. Um, and taken on its own, it would not be a sufficient um, evolutionary account because evolution doesn't operate at the level of groups. But once you have the evolutionary account, I think it is an, an extra layer of the, uh, of the onion, which explains another function that art and stories serve in society, which if you're giving a full accounting of the, the evolutionary origins, but also uh, consequences of storytelling, you need to include the social cohesion uh, element as well. 
And so it's just to say that that additional component, the Yuval Noah Harari component, is basically already included in Boyd's uh, Boyd's thesis. That's, um, that's good to know. There's some redeem. I've been quite allergic to Yuval's novels so far. So yeah, uh, yeah so that's good. That's I, cool I to hear you defending mixed. them yeah. in, in some sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like a lot of his stuff on how like agriculture was the greatest scam the human species has ever like um, engaged in. I just thought was utterly absurd and very poorly defended. It's, it's one of those books that like has some nuggets in it, but a lot of fluff as well. So, so I think I've covered all the notes that I wanted to hit, which is surprising because I thought this would, we wouldn't be able to cover it all, but, but I'm tapped out, brah. What a cool fucking theory, man. (laughs) This is so sick. Like I just, I, I just hope, like, I don't know, it'd be, it'd be cool at one point in my life to be able to come, come up with a theory like this, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, it's just fucking yeah, dope. I totally uh, agree. And it, it, like, it's not widely known enough. It should be much better known because I think it unifies a bunch of different aspects. Um, it gives predictions. It has to square with all of Popper's writing and all of Nabokov's writing as well. And he's managed to do it, which is incredible. Um uh, to, to come up with theory which is consistent with our best theory of epistemology and the greatest living writer in the 20th century. So, I'm extremely writer. excited to read his pauper novel when, I, when it comes yeah, out. Yeah, uh, biography, <laughs> not, not a novel. <laughs> or, sorry, uh, biography. Yeah, it's going to be 30 years in the making, so I can't, can't wait. <laughs> yeah, um, I can, that thing's going to yeah. be in-depth as fuck. Yeah. yeah, totally. All right, brother. Maybe that's it for today. Nice. Yeah, I got nothing. Yeah. Definitely tapped out and decently drunk at the moment. So yeah, <laughs> that's always that's, that's always <laughs> reflective of a good episode. Good place yeah. to leave it. Yeah, I've been drinking since 11 o'clock in the morning. So that's not, <laughs> <Yeah>. not too bad. <laughs> Two Zencaster right. episodes later and we're there. Yeah, that's exactly. Cool. All right. Well, that was fun. I don't know what we're talking about next, but maybe a bit more of this if there's any loose ends. Um, anyways. Okay, cool. We'll talk to you soon.